Um, okay, so thank you for the introduction and welcome to my initial presentation. Super happy to be here today. And as Kala said, I'll be talking about um, the rocky road to Doxis Codex. Here's the very cheesy title. Uh, when Chaco asked me if I wanted to present today, I immediately said yes without a plan. Uh, and then I probed a little bit, what should I talk about? And it seems that this is a, on the mind of a lot of people. They move to Doxis code uh, from maybe something more traditional. And that's certainly been on my radar as well. So I thought, why not give at least give my uh, subjective view on a couple of things related to that. So, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. And uh, as Kala mentioned, I work at SEMCON. SEMCON, just to give a brief context, is a consultant company uh, based in Sweden, about 2,200 employees. And we have two business areas, product information, of which I am part, and then engineering and digital services, which is the other leg in the company. And again, before I go into the uh, subject matter, I uh, just want to give a little bit of context of what I'm working with. So my role in SEMCON is I'm a, an information architect consultant. And so I typically support my clients with strategy work and um, transformation work and, and projects related to how to uh, change how they work with docs or with docs and, and product information in general. So we we typically support our clients with the entire steps in the entire development information development cycle. But for me, um, my focus is on these strategy and information architecture side of things. And in the last couple of years, uh, in doing this work, uh, Doxis Code has become a much more um, obvious recommendation to from me to my clients, as depending on the situation. Um, and uh, and so this is where I got the inspiration from uh, to do this presentation is that uh, in doing that there's a lot of things um, that are commonly recurring as 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 challenges and and perceived issues with Doxis code compared to maybe some more traditional tooling and so I wanted to address that today and and give you my view on that. Um, I myself, my background is also from a more technical or a traditional tech, technical communications background. So as Kalle mentioned also, I've worked and proposed, um, um, been, been a data information architect for a long time. And there are definitely things about that stack to enjoy, but uh, now I'm focusing on Doxis code primarily. Um, but so my introduction, I, when I'm, when I'm talking to my clients about how Doxis code might be a good fit for their situation uh, when, when doing a transformation project. I can obviously recognize the sometimes the hesitation that the client feels um, in, in what Doxis code entails and maybe potential shortcomings and stuff like that. So, so yeah. And uh, while Doxis code is, is uh, and the move towards Doxis code is largely, I mean, that's a technology change. You're, you're swapping out your tools and processes for something different. Um, at the end of the day, it's probably more of a, a human and mental change than, than it's actually about the tools themselves because it's such a fundamentally different to, approach to how you work with documentation. Um, so I'm including this change management, like change curve from uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. I'm not an expert in change management, but I'm including this because this is, I, I can relate to this one. Um, the, the initial stages of shock, denial, and frustration, maybe not depression, um, but uh, uh, when, when we're going through this journey with, with uh, my customers. And, uh, and that's gonna be the focus today. So a little bit about what can cause these feelings in a transformation to Docs' code from the perspective of a technical writer. Um, and perceived weaknesses and and uh, and shortcomings in that area. And there's a lot of things that I could be talking about here, uh, but I've chosen to highlight four um, four topics. And there could be other ones. I thought these might be interesting. Uh, we'll see. Um, so the four topics are complexity, reusability, conformability, and semanticity. And they might not be completely obvious um, 
what they are, but I hope that's going to be more clear as we go through them. Okay, so starting off with complexity, this is probably um, looking at Docs code. This is probably the most obvious issue um, compared to, I mean, if you're a technical writer and you're coming into this, it's it's going to be very very uh, on the surface complex and intimidating uh, if you're used to something else. And a couple of things that make it more intimidating is obviously the things that you have to learn. So typically when moving into Docs code, you, you're going to want to become more familiar with using a CLI or using a terminal um, for interacting with your uh, version control system or something like that. You're also maybe you uh, will need to learn Git. You might have used it before, um, but uh, in either in documentation or in other projects, but to a lot of people uh, moving into Docs code, it's just even working with Git is something new as well. And uh, another example of an added complexity typically when moving into this stuff is maybe you have to get used to a Unix-like system like Linux as well. So these are just a couple of things that um, as maybe a, a less technical person uh, this is going to be uh, very intimidating. Uh, these are all intimidating things. And I think there's no denying that Docs' code in this domain, in this area, is, is not necessarily very user-friendly. Uh, it, it, it demands a lot of the, from the technical writers um, to, to get into these waters. Uh, but, but, but my response to that as well is that uh, I, we shouldn't forget the kind of complexities that we have on the side of the traditional tooling. Um, I've done a lot of teaching myself uh, to newcomers into tech docs, and uh, that involves, you know, data topic-based authoring, CCMS courses, and you know, to people like who maybe have just graduated university uh, as a English teacher or something like that, who, who doesn't have that background, and it's not uncommon with onboarding processes um, of something like two to four weeks um, before a person can even start to be productive in that kind of environment as well. So I think we shouldn't underestimate the level of complexity that we already have with the more traditional tools as well. And then, so if we look at these two um, areas, so we have the traditional tooling where we have learned to learn things like Dita, XSLT, CCMS, um, and an XML editor. And on the Docs code side, we'd have to learn maybe something like script, a script language and the command line again, web dev technologies and Git. Um, while the threshold to overcome might be a little bit higher on the Docs code case, the kind of skills that you have to learn there, are, it's, that's much more universal. Um, and that's going to help you in a lot of more ways than learning XSLT is going to do, frankly, um, at least today. Um, so that's going to carry over maybe to you if you're working on documentation for a software-based product, knowing, understanding, programming to some extent, Git version control is probably going to make you write better content. Um, or if you later in your life want to transition into career of development, then those things are obviously going to be to your benefit. Whereas the tech, tech docs uh, skills that you have to learn to get going um, maybe are not as, as universally useful. Okay, next area I wanted to touch on is reusability. So this is also something that's perceived sometimes as potential shortcomings in docs code compared to traditional tech docs. So I mean, with reusability, I mean, the single sourcing of content, create ones, publish everywhere. And our normal tools, there's a lot of uh, support for this in different ways. We have filtering of content through something like conditional processing, includes uh, as confs or variables, um, being able to replace specific string values or something like that in the content. So this is obviously, this is not exclusive to technical uh, content either. This is a big topic in copywriting and other fields of writing too. And it certainly solves 
a problem. Um, being able to reuse and manage a piece of content in one place rather than copy pasting, there are obvious benefits to this, um, of course. So it's not there without a reason. And mainstream tech docs tends to put a great emphasis on content reuse. And I often question a little bit like, why are we putting so much emphasis on this? And I think, you know, this content reuse, write once, publish everywhere. It's easy to grasp. Um, everyone can understand this on, on the surface. It's a concept that's quantifiable as well. Um, there's even been a, uh, some push into developing KPIs for measuring how much content do you reuse. You can think what you want about that, but uh, that's true. Uh, vendors love to talk about how their tools support content reuse in various ways and how much more efficient you will be to manage your content using this tool. And consultants like myself, um, we also love to talk about how you should do reuse. Um, so I don't know. I think the, the concept of content reuse probably in our domain is a little bit over um, overvalued, I think. But OK, anyway, it's like it solves a problem. And so looking at Docs' code, generally speaking, maybe the level of reuse if, compared to something like Dira is not, is not there. Uh, there is a varying degree of support for reuse, of course, in the Docs' code space. We have restructured text, which supports substitutions. This is a variable case. And then, and then includes ASCII docs also support filtering. And then we have all of the static site generator hacks that we can do, with the, whether Gatsby or Hugo or MK docs or something else, there's support for enabling different kinds of reuse through the SSG. And then lastly, I think one thing not to overlook as well is the kind of support that you can get from the language programming language that uses as a base for your docs code project. So if you're using a docs code tooling that's based on Node.js, you have access probably to NPM and if you're using something like Gatsby, you can author your content in MDX and you could import reusable components as React components. I'm not going to go into details obviously here, but there is probably something that you could do there as well, maybe, depending on the use case. So uh, to sum it up, um, there's varying degrees of support for reuse in the Docs code space. Um, but I think compared to the traditional tech talks, it doesn't emphasize it so much and doesn't have that kind of support. Uh, but I think also the tech docs, traditional tech docs is more maybe um, of uh, covering the edge cases. So I think a lot of cases can actually be supported by this, but, uh, but maybe the edge cases can't. And I think when we're coming to edge cases and reuse where you maybe have to mix a lot of these mechanisms, I don't think that's where you'll see the return of investment that reuse is promised and to deliver. Okay, moving on to the next uh, area, which I called conformability, which is a weird word, of course, but what I mean by this is the this kind of support that you have for validating uh, your that the content that you develop follows the kind of rules and structures that you want it to. And in traditional tech talks, again, we have a lot of support for this, and perceivably on the surface, Docs's code doesn't have that out of the box. Whereas traditional tooling have things like the DTD and XSD validation, schematron rules for real-time feedback, uh, quality analysis tools like um, what's it called, Acrolinks, Love Acrolinks, um, and then you know support for validating links and file references and expanding link texts and the editor and all that stuff. That's something that we have really good support for in the traditional tools. Whereas in the Docs Code tools, I mean we have some tools that we uh, some methods that we could use to to replicate that kind of functionality but i don't think we will be able to get that far um, whenever i write markdown content with my with vs code i always use a markdown lint plugin to make sure that i'm not doing anything stupid um, we are typically running our docs code stuff in a development server locally which gives us kind of a validation step of at least it's able to compile Arguably, the development environment might be slightly different from the production environment, but generally speaking, it's a good validation step as well. And then we have the CI tests. Um, so 
Uh, to some extent, we can still validate that our content follows our structures. If we have an information model, we can we can develop tests to make sure that the, the um, IM is followed. And here, I mean, um, that's time that you would have to invest, obviously, in the, in developing the tooling support for that. But um, that's also, I mean, that's generally the case with Docs code, right? You have to put more of your own time in as opposed to buying the service from some vendor that has already developed it and packages as a service. So that's just a, a couple of comments on um, conformability. I don't have a lot more to say about that. And then last item um, on my list is semanticity. So my definition of this here is the ability to be able to decouple um, the meaning of content from how it's presented and why we do uh, take pride in, in highly semantic content is because I guess uh, we want content to be machine readable um, so that we can perform al algorithms in, of some kind on it. And I really like this picture, so I, I stole it. This is from Mark Baker uh, from a series of articles that he did on structured writing, which is also the title of his latest book. I really recommend reading that. Um, so, but this image is just showing a little spectrum here of different uh, stages or different levels of structure to content. Whereas on the left, towards the left, we have more structured content and less, um, it's less, uh, it contains less information about how it should be presented meaning that you will run those algorithms independently of, of the content itself. And then on the right, we have more uh, like content in the media domain, as he refers to it, which is, includes more instructions of how it should be presented, where you have the words in literally in Italian comic sounds. So that's less semantic, which means that it's less machine readable, uh, of course. And so we typically pride ourselves because we're writing in XML and the reason we're writing in XML to a large extent is because we believe that our content is semantic. Um, and if we look at um, our documentation, oftentimes I think we, we come to the conclusion that actually it's, I mean, what, what by semantic we mean that the markup language represents the meaning of the content, not the document structure. But a lot of these markup languages are in fact sits very firmly in the document domain as opposed to the subject domain, if we follow Mark Baker's definitions here. Um, so most of the time, the markup consists of para, title, you know, stuff like that anyway. So at the end of the day, how semantic is really the content that we develop? And then the follow-up question to that is, uh, how much are we using the metadata? Um, so are we very advanced in how we use the level of semanticity in the content? Um, do we create, generate knowledge graphs or, or databases by, by munging or crawling the content? Or are we looking into something like in the IRDS, Intelligent Information Delivery System, uh, Retrieval and the Delivery System uh, for really creating very flexible and modular content? Or are we just using it to put metadata in our head tag in HTML? maybe based on some open standard um, for metadata like Google's uh, schema.org or Facebook's Open Graph or Dublin Core? Or are we simply using this detachment from uh, between presentation and meaning to be able to generate multiple output formats? And so how semanticity relates to Docs' code is obviously Docs' code is, it doesn't take pride in having a syntax that's semantic, um, but instead the, the, the syntax is lightweight markup language. So there's no pretending um, that the content is semantic on that level. Um, so this is kind of a, something to think about, I think, uh, when, when, when criticizing the use of lightweight markup languages. Okay, and I don't know how I'm doing on time. Probably I was too fast, but that would leave some time for questions. I just have a couple of end comments. So um, <laughs> the rocky road to Docs' code, uh, it can sometimes be a long and hard journey. Um, 
there are going to be uh, probably physical and mental obstacles and problems to overcome. In this presentation, I've highlighted a couple of things that I sometimes see recurrently um, my colleagues in these projects perceive as potential issues and risks with moving towards a DOCSIS code-based tooling. And I want to downplay these issues because I think most of the time we're thinking about edge cases and the issues are probably more theoretical than they're real. And I think with the pragmatic approach, um, these kinds of issues can be overcome. And in doing so, it will allow the organization to take advantage of the obvious benefits of DOCSIS code, which I haven't talked about today, which is obviously things like customization and flexibility, being able to automate the release, uh, collaboration improvements, and uh, being able to take advantage of modern front-end frameworks. So yeah, that was um, all I had. So I think we can move on to questions if that's uh, if anyone has any questions to me. I don't know how was uh, <clears throat> Yes, we have two questions in Slack. Okay. The first is from Choco. Uh, she is asking, what, except Markdown, the other languages like ASCII doc don't seem to have WYSIWYG like DITA in that sense. What do you think about investing on integrating DITA automatically into docs like code pipelines for big organizations? Mm. Um, so I think uh, uh, there are is solving a problem and I think Docs's code is solving another problem. There's nothing wrong with integrating, uh, I think that uh, publishing with with a CI, but I, th I don't think you should uh, mix the two. I think they're uh, like something like Dira um, and, and Docs's code are solving different problems. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to mix them together and tangle them too much. Uh, generally that's like, uh, yeah, a blanket statement there, but. Yeah. I can actually say that that's exactly how we work mm -hmm. in my company. Uh, so we we use Git for version control. We have a repository in Bitbucket. We have automated builds and publishing, but we author our content in uh, Dira XML. Mm -hmm. So it it can work. Like obviously not ideal if you want a lot of contribution from developers. That's not the case for us. Uh, however, contributions are still possible through pull requests, but also contributing directly into the repository. So it can work. So, so just to be depends clear, on the use case. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm not against into, uh, using Git based and uh, mm. version control for for data content and integrating maybe with something like GitHub Actions to automate the build process. That's that's a good idea. Um, what I was referring to maybe was the mixing of lightweight markup languages and data based content and and trying to build some kind of ecosystem around that, I think, keep mm. those things separate. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. We have another question from Kale. Uh, he's asking, which which customers do you advise to use Docs code and which customers do you advise to go with the traditional tooling? Mm. Uh, generally, of course, software-based companies are, are going to lean more towards the, the being applicable to, work, to working with Docs code. Um, but there are some issues even there, I think if you're prone to to heavy translation work and stuff like that, then uh, then I'm also hesitant to to do that recommendation. Um, and then we have, I mean, some clients of mine that are working maybe with more traditional hardware products that where Docs code could also be slightly more difficult. Where actually, like going back to reusability, uh, where reuse is is a very big and important cornerstone, then I would not not, not necessarily firstly recommend uh, Docs code, uh, but more more like when you're looking for uh, the benefits that CI CD and contributions uh, would bring you. Yeah. I don't have anything else at the moment. Oh, here's one. Do you recommend Docs as code for customer documentation, like more traditional user manuals? Yeah, sure. Uh, but you'd need to know more maybe about the use cases, but I don't, uh, I mean, so it, it's much easier to integrate modern front-end frameworks and thereby um, provide a better user experience 
to your customers if you use a Codoxus code based tool, and generally speaking. So I would generally yeah, recommend that. Cool. Yep. Nothing else so far. Uh, so I forgot to say that you uh, uh, that you can during this talk uh, post your questions in Slack and uh, Sweden channel uh, or in here in the chat here. Uh, but you, if you have any questions right now, so please unmute yourself and uh, post it to David. No. So, uh, David, where can we find you if you, ha if you have any uh, questions that we pick up? On Slack, clients? yeah. Let's do it on Slack. I think that's the best. I have a website, davidcarlson.tech. You can go there as well if you want. Um, but uh, Slack is the best option, I think. All right. So, uh, do we have any more questions in this? Nope. No. All right. So thank you so much, David. Uh, that was a really good one. Uh, I learned a lot, actually. Uh, so uh, a big applause to you. Thank you very much. Yeah.